Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. Chapter 1, The God of All Comfort. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. An apostle of Jesus Christ, a sent one. When Paul was in Corinth originally, he showed the Corinthians his apostleship by his patience, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds as is recorded in chapter 12 of this epistle. By the will of God, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, Ephesians 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of. Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful. In Christ Jesus, Colossians 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, 2 Timothy 1 verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. The Church of God, a called out assembly of believers. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 unto the Church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 1 Timothy 3 verse 5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the Church of God? The Church at Jerusalem was also called a Church of God. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Galatians 1 verse 13 For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, and wasted it. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 2 Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you and peace. This is the dispensation of grace, and God is not at enmity, war, with us. Paul never mentions grace and peace as coming from the Holy Spirit because he is dwelling in them that are in the body of Christ. From God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace does not come from Paul, but rather it comes from God the Father, and Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 2 verse 7 I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Matthew 3 verse 17 And lo a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Ephesians 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The Father of mercies, real mercy originates from God, for He alone is qualified to bestow it upon whomsoever He chooses. He was merciful to us in saving us when we deserved hell. Blessed be His name. The God of all comfort, He can comfort us in any situation we find ourselves in here on the earth concerning physical things and He can also comfort us concerning all spiritual things. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4 Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6 and 13 that we may be able to comfort them which are also in any trouble, our tribulation can bring us comfort from God, and it is also for the benefit of others around us so that they might see Christ in us during our tribulation. We are able to comfort others when we tell them of the tribulation we went through and how God brought us through it. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 5 For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The sufferings of Christ abound in us. There were many persecutions that Paul and his helpers endured, and Paul calls those sufferings, the sufferings of Christ. Paul filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in his flesh, for the body's sake, which is the church, so that he could make what Christ did for us known to the world. Colossians 1 verse 24 Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So, our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him.
2 Timothy 2 verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Our consolation is what we receive because we have suffered for Christ. Eternal life, rewards. Romans 15 verse 5, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 7, and not by his. Coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Philippians 2 verse 1 If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 16 Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 6 And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Paul was not teaching that consolation and salvation may be obtained by the Corinthians at the expense of Paul being persecuted for bringing the gospel to them. Salvation was already secured for them in the person of Christ when he suffered and died for the sins of the world, but Paul was saying to the Corinthians that there is reward, consolation, for the suffering they endured. As Paul and Timothy ministered and were persecuted, people were saved because of their willingness to suffer persecution repeatedly. They will be rewarded for their sacrifice as will you for yours. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 7 And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing, that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. The consolation, the reward in the end. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8 For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Acts 19 verse 23 And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Our trouble which came to us in Asia, the Corinthians drew strength from the testimony of Paul and Timothy that they endured the persecution at Philippi and in Ephesus, which is in Asia, and yet they came out on the other side still praising God. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 9 to 10 But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which riseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul and Timothy came to the point that there was no way they could deliver themselves and God stepped in and delivered them. 2 Corinthians 4 If God can raise someone from the dead, then saving their life would be a breeze. Paul learned from this that God would be there for him to help him accomplish his will for his life. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 11 Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf. The gift bestowed upon us, the offering that was taken up. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 12 to 14 For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you, Lord. For we write none other things unto you, than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul was speaking about his previous letter to them in verse 13 and that he realized that some had received his first letter and had repented while unfortunately the obedience was only in part. Some had not yet repented, but Paul rejoiced in those that had repented, and that they could now rejoice as they ought to in having gotten right with God and man. In the day of the Lord Jesus, the rapture of the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 15 And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit. 
A second benefit, Paul wanted to impart more truth to the Corinthians, but the time was not ready because there was still too much going on in Corinth that needed to be corrected before they could receive something new from Paul. There were still some babes in Christ that needed to get off the bottle spiritually speaking. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 16 to 18 And to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea yea, and nay nay? But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. And of you to be brought on my way toward you, the Corinthians were to help Paul get to Judea financially. That with me there should be yea and nay. Paul spoke for God and there was no back and forth going on, just Paul telling them like it was about that which God expects of us. He did not say he would come based on his fleshly desire. It was his prayer that he could go if God wanted him to go at that time because there were some that were not ready for Paul to visit yet. He truly wanted to go only when God thought it to be best, not himself or someone at Corinth. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 19 to 20 For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. In him was yea, a promise from Christ to either Paul for the body of Christ is a guarantee. What God says will happen, will happen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 21 to 22 Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He which establisheth us with you in Christ. Paul talked about the Corinthians being established by God's word in Paul's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Romans 16 verse 25 Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13 To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. Before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 17 Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 3 But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you, and keep you from evil, and hath anointed us. We were anointed when we were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. It means we were set apart, consecrated. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Who hath also sealed us, Ephesians 1 verse 13 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 4 verse 30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts, the earnest is a down payment of the Spirit that we received when we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5 Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Ephesians 1 verse 14 Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. The rest of the payment and the best are yet to come when we step into the heavens one day. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 23 to 24 Moreover I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. I call God for a record upon my soul, a similar thing is said by God and Moses. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, 
Deuteronomy 31 verse 28 Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. Dominion over your faith. Paul did not use his office as the apostle to the Gentiles to demand things of people that would provide comfort for him in his life. In fact, the opposite was true. Paul didn't want anyone to have a reason to doubt his sincerity in bringing them the gospel of the grace of God. Helpers of your joy, Paul rejoiced that he was able to help minister unto the people of Corinth just like Christ who came to minister and not be ministered unto. Chapter 2 Forgiving in the Person of Christ 2 Corinthians 2 verses 1 to 2 But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that mocketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? Paul was sending the church in Corinth this letter in lieu of a visit for the time being because the atmosphere Paul discerned was not ready for his return. He had hoped this epistle would show his desire for those who had not repented of their previous deeds in allowing sin to fester in the congregation and who even gloried in what they professed to be their liberality in Christ. They would now understand that salvation does not give us the right to condone sin in our midst. These according to this epistle were Paul's chief opponents in the church. He had also hoped that those who had repented and who had exercised church discipline on the man who was living in open incest would now forgive that man and restore him seeing how he had repented of his gross immorality. A judgmental attitude and an attitude of condoning any sin is sin itself. Satan is a master at using the sin in a church committed by one or a small handful of believers and allowing others to sin concerning their attitudes concerning that sin. Those that had done the right thing in disciplining this man Paul was happy about, but then some of those same people now would not forgive the person and allow him back into the congregation once he had repented which was just as wrong. Others thought the whole thing was a waste of time because they were under grace and acted as if they could do what they pleased, and God would not care. Paul wanted every aspect of the sin, which turned into a multitude of sins, to be resolved biblically by all so that they may be joy in the church at Corinth again. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 3 And I wrote the same unto you, lest, when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. If each party continued in their sin, then Paul would of course be sorrowful and not joyful when he returned to Corinth. He would address each area of this problem with the word of God as his tool to bring about a healing to the seemingly insurmountable rift that had developed about a man who now was very remorseful over his sin. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 4 For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. The more Paul loved the church at Corinth, the more he would care that they would make the right decisions. Paul not only loved the church at Corinth because he was the one that established it, they were like family to him. He had the responsibility as their apostle to see that they continued in the faith and practices that were delivered unto them by him. Some in this church were acting like rebellious teenagers who want no authority in their life but themselves. 2 Corinthians 2 verses 5 to 7 But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. I may not overcharge you all. One man's sin had turned a church upside down and Satan was gaining a stronger foothold in this church, even after the person had repented. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1 It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Such a man, if the self-righteous crowd were to continue in their ways unchecked, then the repentant person's sorrow could lead to his departure because of his overmuch. Sorrow. 2 Corinthians 2 verses 8 to 9 Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. Paul wanted the church to go to him and ask him to return to the church and to confirm that they love him and the Lord. 
It is one thing to say you have forgiven someone and it is another thing to show them you have forgiven them. 2 Corinthians 2 verses 10 to 11 To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, forgiveness is a shield that deflects the wiles, devices, of Satan, so it doesn't hurt us. A door was opened. 2 Corinthians 2 verses 12 to 13 Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Christ's gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 A door was opened unto me of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9 For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Colossians 4 verse 3 With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus. Titus told Paul that the Corinthians were remorseful after Paul's first letter to them. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 5 to 7 4 When we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. 2 Corinthians 2 verses 14 to 16 Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and mocketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish, to the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? The savor of his knowledge, when we do the right thing in the right way God accepts our offerings and it is a sweet savor, smell, to him and to those around us who are saved or lost. A savor of death unto death, for the lost it shows them both the love of God and eternal consequences of rebelling against his will. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 For we are not as many, which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Many, which corrupt the word of God, those who corrupt the word of God were those who gloried in the sin of this man early on because it justified their sins. They used this situation to get what they wanted instead of what God intended. God's word did what was intended once it was acted upon. Chapter 3 Able Ministers of the New Testament 2 Corinthians 3 verse 1 Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Do we begin again to commend ourselves? They once recognized Paul's apostleship when he first came there and began their church. Acts 18 Epistles of Commendation Paul should not have to list his credentials to this church because he started it at God's leading, and many there knew that, but it didn't take much for Satan to lead people away from their foundation. Paul's apostleship was questioned by some at Corinth because he was not one of the twelve apostles to the nation of Israel. The twelve needed no epistle of commendation, but many that had been sent out to do a work from Jerusalem would often be sent with letters of commendation from the twelve verifying this person was speaking on their behalf or with their approval. Paul did not need a letter of commendation for Corinth because Paul was not sent out as a representative of the church in Jerusalem, but he was sent out by Christ himself as the apostle of the Gentiles. Romans 11 verse 13 it was Paul that had the responsibility to send out letters of commendation to churches on the behalf of those he had sent out to do a work among the Gentiles. In many of his epistles, Paul recommends a particular minister to be received by a church as being sent from him. For example, Romans 16 verses 1 to 2, I commend unto you Phoebe our sister, which is a servant of the 
church which is at Sencria, that ye receive her in the Lord, as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many, and of myself also. Timothy, Timotheus, was sent by Paul to both Corinth and Thessalonica with letters of commendation from him to them to receive him as coming from Paul. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17 For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 10 Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Philippians 2 verse 19 But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort, when I know your state. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2 Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known, and read of all men. Ye are our epistle. The church at Corinth itself was Paul's letter of commendation written as Paul says in his heart which is far better than any letter that could be forged. Paul said that his epistle, the Corinthians, was first of all known of all men, and also read of all men in that area. Everyone knew of the church in Corinth because it was the largest of Paul's churches. Unfortunately, not everything that people knew about this church was good. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3 For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. God did a work through His Holy Spirit in the lives of these Corinthian people in bringing them to Christ through Paul's ministry and everyone knew that it was God. Where were the twelve? They were busy still reaching out unto none but the circumcision, Jews, and Paul it was that was given the dispensation of the grace of God to take the gospel of the grace of God to the Gentiles. Not in tables of stone, notice Paul's comparison of the tables of stone, the law of Moses, with the fleshly tables of the heart. The dispensation of grace is better than the dispensation of the law because we obey out of our heart of love instead of out of fear of not doing everything on a list written in stone. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 4 to 5 And such trust have we through Christ to God ward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of God. The Corinthian church itself was their letter of commendation to those who thought they needed a letter of approval from Jerusalem. Paul was not under the authority of Jerusalem, nor did they send him, God did, and he was all they needed. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6 Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Able ministers of the New Testament, Christ died and shed his innocent blood, which was shed for all people in every dispensation. Hebrews 9 verse 17 A testament is of force after men are dead, it is no strength at all while. The testator liveth, not of the letter, the letter of the law. In Jeremiah 31 verse 31 God said through Jeremiah that he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah which simply means the two nations will be reunited as one nation during the kingdom, but then it goes on to say that he will write the law in their hearts. That hasn't happened yet, and that is precisely why Peter and the other eleven apostles to the nation of Israel are not described as also being able ministers of the New Testament. They will be one day when Israel is reunited in the kingdom, and they sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel, but not today. Matthew 19 verse 28 And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But of the Spirit, today the Church, the body of Christ, is made able ministers of the New Testament by knowing God's plan for this age. We have to be able to rightly divide the mystery epistles given to the body of Christ from the Hebrew epistles. An able minister doesn't mix them with the New Testament teachings regarding Israel's future in their kingdom. 
2 Corinthians 3 verse 7 But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. The ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, the wages of sin is death. The law was given to show that there was none righteous, no not one. Galatians teaches us that the law, the first testament, was given because of transgressions until the seed should come. That seed was Jesus Christ, and he is the testator that had to die fulfilling the old to usher in the new which will be far better, because it will be written in their, Israel's, hearts and not on stone. While the testator died to redeem them that were under the law, he also died for us that would believe during the age of grace. Both groups are recipients of salvation because of his work on Calvary. This ministration, the law, is also referred to as the ministration of condemnation in verse 8 below. The glory of his countenance, his face that shined with God's glory on it. Which glory was to be done away? Just as the glory upon Moses gradually faded away so the law would wax old and vanish away. Hebrews 8 verse 13 in that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 8 to 9 How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. The ministration of the Spirit, this is also called the ministration of righteousness in verse 9. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 10 to 11 For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. That which is done away, the law. The New Testament is for the house of Judah, and for the house of Israel when they are united again during the kingdom. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Paul teaches us today in the body of Christ that we are benefactors of the New Testament as well as Israel howbeit in a different way. We are benefited in spiritual ways in heavenly places while Israel will be benefited in physical ways during the kingdom. Much more that which remaineth is glorious. What we in the body of Christ have today under grace is much more glorious than what Israel had under the law. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 12 Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. We have such hope, we have the rapture of all saints at the end of this age. Israel under the law had to look forward to the 70th week of Daniel before their kingdom. The promises of Jeremiah 31 verse 31 were not made to the body of Christ. God will enable the Jew in the kingdom to keep the law that God will write on their hearts because of what transpired on the cross for them. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 13 And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Exodus 34 verse 33 Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. As Moses, which put a veil over his face, a veil is meant to conceal what is underneath. While Moses dictated the law to Israel, there was no veil upon his face, and the people could see the glory of the Lord upon him as he spoke. To the end of that which is abolished, when he had finished speaking unto them, he then placed the veil on his face at that time, so the people could not see the glory of the Lord departing. The law was abolished in Christ. Remember what the leaders of Israel said when they heard Stephen preaching a message given to him by the Lord? Acts 6 verse 15 And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. We don't have to put a veil over our face when we finish telling the wonderful ministry of grace that God has given to us because it will not fade away because it is more glorious. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 14 But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Their minds were blinded, Israel could not see the fulfillment of the law and the Messiah because they chose not to see based on their flesh's desire to keep themselves under the law because of tradition. 
For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away, it goes on to say, in the reading of the Old Testament. In Paul's day the blindness of their minds was still there as they would read the Old Testament, but it didn't have to be. Which veil is done away in Christ? When a Jew today accepts Christ as their Savior there in Christ's body, in Christ, and can see things they couldn't see previously in God's Word. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 15 to 16 But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Paul isn't speaking to the individual Jew here, but to the nation as a whole. They have eyes that cannot see because they rejected God's word in the past. When it shall turn to the Lord, that it is a reference to Israel. There is coming a day when all of Israel will be saved and have that veil taken away at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble just prior to the beginning of the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17 Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is liberty. This is not speaking of liberty to sin, but have liberty to serve God and love from the hearts and not out of duty to the law. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. From glory to glory, we do not have a veil upon our faces or on our hearts today as believers because we were never under the law in the first place. We look at what Christ has done, and we see it as clearly as looking in a glass mirror and we move from the glory of a created being to the glory of the new creature by the Spirit of the Lord. Chapter 4 The Light of the Glorious Gospel 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1-2 to Therefore seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Having this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. See chapter 3. Handling the word of God deceitfully. To not rightly divide the word of truth is to handle the word of God deceitfully. Sincere people are in the ministry, and they are deceiving the people they want to help, but they have been deceived by someone in their past who did not know how to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 to 4 But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 6. Paul here proclaimed to the Corinthian hearers that the gospel that we are supposed to preach today, the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20 verse 14, is hidden to them that are lost. Our gospel, he called it here our gospel because it was different from the kingdom gospel that was still being preached back in Israel to the circumcision. The word gospel simply means good news. Matthew 4 verse 23. Matthew 4 verse 23 And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. The gospel that Paul preached was unheard of to the Jew under the law because Paul emphasized the cross as the means by which people could be saved. The God of this world, Satan is the God, small g, of this world as all who do not belong to Christ by being saved by believing Paul's gospel or following their father, God, the devil. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5 For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. While Paul magnifies his office and his message, he is careful never to magnify himself. Romans 11 verse 13 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Genesis 1 verses 1 to 2 In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Paul takes us back to the account of creation and compares it to our receiving the gospel. 
He also compares the gospel that he preaches today as a light that shines in our hearts and that shows the glory of God, not on the face of Moses the lawgiver, but an even more glorious light emanating from the face of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. This treasure in earthen vessels, this is the gospel of grace that he and we preach today, and the earthen vessels are the recipients that carry that good news. God could have chosen the angels to preach his gospel instead of fallen sinful man, but he uses the weak things of this world to confound the strong so that he gets all the glory. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 8 to 9 We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Paul, in his comparison of believers being similar to vessels, informs us that even though we as vessels may be surrounded by danger, we don't have to cry out to the world to save us for he is there. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10 Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Oh, that we would be found faithful to want to tell others of Christ's sacrificial dying on our behalf as well as his perfect life which he lived for us that we might have eternal life. They go hand in hand, you can't have one without the other. Remember it is our bodies that are the earthen vessels that carry about the glorious gospel. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 11 to 12 For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So, then death worketh in us, but life in you. As we suffer and make sacrifices by dying to ourselves, others will see that Christ-like spirit of giving for others in us, and they will be attracted to the Christ who dwells in us and lives through us. Many were risking their lives for the gospel's sake and people were receiving life because of it, eternal life. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. Psalm 116 verse 10, I believed, therefore have I spoken, I was greatly afflicted. Paul quotes King David where he is praising God for his goodness and life and death, and while David is alive, he plans to make the best of it and praise the Lord. He will not fear death while he is alive, and he will praise him in all his adversities. It wasn't silent praise, nor was it secret praise. David was public with his praise. We should be public with the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 14 Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. He which raised up the Lord Jesus. Here Paul talks about the blessed hope or rapture of the body of Christ the church, as if he expects Christ to come in his lifetime by his use of the pronoun us in verse 14 where he talks about being raised up. Romans 4 verse 24, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you, Romans 4 verse 24 and Ephesians 5 verse 22. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 15 to 16 For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul wants us to know that through our thanksgiving towards God for his grace others will see and understand the glory of God for themselves. Our outward man perish, our outward body is decaying daily because of the sin nature we inherited from Adam. The inward man is renewed day by day, it is our inner man that he renews daily through his spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 23 And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Colossians 3 verse 10 And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17 For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, the things we suffer in this life are, but a small thing compared to the blessings of eternity. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18 While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Temporal, temporary, eternal, they will last forever.
There are rewards for our service and suffering for the cause of Christ which will be revealed one day when faith becomes sight. When we stand in His presence, we will clearly see the eternal investments that we have made in this life, and it will be worth it all when we see Jesus.